Hopefully we don't get um, monetized for that. But other than that, welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 2, Episode 12. With myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hey. So please, as ever, guys, leave a like, leave a comment, and subscribe. And uh, on this week's show, Sam's going to bring us up to date with everything industry standard. And um, then we're actually going to be talking about Bond. The reason being is that we were meant to have Bond, well it was delayed, um, No Time to Die. It was meant to come out in November this year, but it's been pushed back to next year. Um, so, well, we just thought we'd talk about Bond. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, without further ado, over to you Sam, industry. It's been relatively quiet, I blame Thanksgiving. But there were a couple of stories that I uh, picked up on. Uh, Chan Tatum is going to team up with Philip Lord and Miller, who were obviously the geniuses who did the Lego movie. Uh, 21 Jump Street, they're going to make a Universal Monster movie. Which is really cool, because the whole Universal Monster movie, they, they've given up on that whole dark universe rubbish, and instead are allowing directors to just go, how about this for a monster movie? And it could be serious, comical, not forcing a connection. And it worked for The Invisible Man, so those two together, Chan and Tatum, he can be funny as hell as well. So I'm curious what they're going to do. Is there not any like rumours about what, what they're doing? No, they're keeping a completely mystery story. Uh, All they know is it's going to be... It's definitely a comedy horror. Uh, so it's, you know, they're, they're going to go crazy. They, yeah. they, they're very good at using brands and being able to mix them where it doesn't feel too cynical. So, um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Lord and Miller obviously are just about to do a, another... Because there's loads of astronaut films at the moment, but it's gonna, they're going to do another one with Ryan Gosling. And they've got a bunch of TV series of Apple and rebooting Clone Highs. So they're busy as hell, so I don't even know when this film's going to get made. But right now, everyone wants just to announce things to get people excited when, you know, we're in a bit of a void. Talking of voids, Pink Panther is to be uh, remade again. Um, <laughs> How many iterations? Well, this one, this one seems to be more towards the cartoon. It's a mix of animation and live action. And it's from the guy who did Sonic. So you go, ah, okay, kind of know what to expect now, right? Yeah, I mean, I Can't haven't seen me. Sonic, so I don't, I don't but know. It gives me a Roger yeah, Rabbit I get, vibe. I get that. You get the vibe of animation mixed with real people, basically. Yeah. It's, it's one of those sort of stories. And because they can get the animation so closer to the actual, you know, original drawing as opposed to some CGI abomination that the 2000s was full of, I don't know. It's yeah. like Tom and Jerry. They've just made a new Tom and Jerry movie and they look like fucking Tom and Jerry but in the real world because animation is a lot better. Mm. Doesn't mean it's going to be great but at least it's actually keeping the legacy of those characters for a new generation where you go, yeah, that's the Tom and Jerry I know. I mean, they tried to do a Sonic, didn't they? And they had yeah. to quickly reapply it to the other Sonic and it made loads of money and got some good response. So, Talking again of films that may one day get made because that's what most of this week's about. <laughs> Gremlins Free. Chris Columbus, who was the original writer of Gremlins and the director of Home Alone and a lot of chill... I think he did the first two Harry Potters as well. A lot of those kind of films. He still thinks there's going to be a Gremlins 3. Now, there hasn't been a Gremlins film since 1991. That's a long time. And he's still saying it's going to be practical effects. That doesn't seem very likely in the modern age. And HBO are doing their own animated prequel TV series at the moment, so... It sounds more like a fantasy that he'd like to do as opposed to a reality. But I'm all for another Gremlins 3 that's practical effects and nuts. Because the Gremlins films are mental. The second one is so meta, it's nuts. I love it. And finally, we're going to have a QA next Thursday at 8pm on the Trash Arts Facebook page. This is to help for our Indiegogo for acting and decline. It will feature myself. Ryan will be on it, and we'll have Annabella Rich and hopefully a few others from the cast of Acting and Decline. The idea is we're going to give you a bit more about the films to help for the Indiegogo. Now, we're going to hopefully, uh, we want people to give us questions. So if you want to ask questions about the film or anything to do with the actors, feel free to ask them. Obviously try and keep it within films. Don't need any harassment. <laughs> it's just been, you know, kind of ruins the flow when harassment comes in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we hope you can join us next Thursday for the Q&A on Acting and Decline. We'll be showing a couple of scenes from the films and talking about them too. And hopefully you can still support the Indiegogo, 
which the link will be down below. Yeah, and if you can, please go and support it. If you can, just give it a share. Because, um, yeah, it just widens our scope and uh, hopefully gets us out there. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that, Sam. So, this week we decided to talk about Bond. So, James Bond has been around for nearly 60 years, believe it or not. Crazy. Yeah, so 2022 will be the 60th anniversary of Doctor No, which was the first iteration of James Bond canonically canonically chronologically sorry? yeah well not chronologically can like within terms oh, of the, the yeah I so see. the first out of the 25 yeah, yeah, so yeah. no time to die was meant to be the fifth 25th yes. anniversary um of the films and um, <clears throat> so yeah everything bond i want to start where it all began dr no and um yeah the sean connery era you're gonna do a connery impression Irmish Money Penner. You gave it a go. Ah, James Bond. James Bond. Do you want to try? No. <laughs> Especially in respect to obviously he, he passed. Yeah, recently. rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> you just set me up for the fall. <laughs> so, yeah, with Dr. No, um, <clears throat> personally, like, I don't think it was the first Bond that I actually saw whenever I was growing up, but whenever I went back and started watching them all, it's definitely one that stands out and sets the franchise up for what it then starts to become. Um, and I think, I, I, well, I could be wrong on this, but I remember sort of thinking at the time when I was younger that this was something different for the era, that, like the stuff that was coming out at the time. Um, you had this suave secret agent who kind of isn't really that secret about it um, <laughs> and he uncovers the, the Doctor No plot and yeah I, I think that set it up for what was then to come years later. I think it's interesting with um, being being that we are British male kids well not adults but we were kids <laughs> once upon a time <laughs> everyone has a particular bond. I was cloned I was never a kid <laughs> it is even the bond that's around coming out around that time that you've seen clips of it or you saw a trailer and then suddenly your, your dad's like or, or your mum's just like time to get you in the bond and for some reason terrestrial TV always had the bond season yeah I remember yeah on ITV there would always be like you only live twice or whatever playing well this is the thing around the same time I believe there was some anniversary because it was all the big VHS box set came out and because the the idea was, ah, oh, we can't afford that, that's way too expensive, and you have to add another bloody film every two years. You record, record it. it on yeah, VHS. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I'm always going to have these, and then a year later, oh, the Bond season's back. The hell's the point in this tape? <laughs> Everyone comes into Bond at a certain point, but when you're younger, there is something magical about it. This whole series of this spy going on all these adventures throughout time itself because of the fact that it's been going on for bloody forever, you know? And it is like a little door into the kind of culture that was going on around those times. I think like, yeah, you know, growing up with it, the times that we did when there were so many films, it did, it did feel like more like a series of films rather than sort of like a standalone film. I do wonder like what, you know, and the first sort of uh, films came out, obviously there were books beforehand, but how people must have felt so differently about them at the time. Like, you know, because that would have been a, a, a big event, a new thing kind of, you know, it, it wasn't the same as when you look back retrospectively and go like, look at all of this stuff, this is, uh, you well, know. This is the thing, if you think about serialised films, so we've discussed before with franchises, the Bond franchise comes in at that weird time where, I don't know, I don't think there was too many franchises around that time. I think the only other kind of franchise you could sort of argue was around in the 60s is Westerns. Well, even, well, Pink Panther would be one that started from the, from the 60s and like some comedies and things like that. But as far as like a world event kind of franchise, it was one of the first kind of big ones. And the fact that the, um, did From Russian With Love come out a year later? Or was it so that, that's one thing I was going to touch Crazy. on. <clears throat> the turnaround between the first three films was so quick. So Dr. No came out in 1962. From Russia with Love came out 1963, and then even Goldfinger, which arguably to many fans is the best Bond film mm. out there, came out in 1964. Now, I, if you think about any kind of films that came out between the 60s and even to modern day, the likelihood of having a turnaround within a year is so like rare. But in doing so, they built out the brand. Like, the brand was there within those three years. 
And also with Dr. No, not Dr. No, sorry, with Goldfinger in particular, that's like kind of how most action films got set up after that, like big adventure films of how the bad guy was and how the, it was like the archetype of where um, Hollywood action cinema would always take from. It's like the standard, as it were, you know? And I think it, it's kind of crazy they did that within three years of just probably p pumping Bond out to that audience like crazy. So it became a cultural icon in a very quick amount of time. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of it, how quickly Bond became a, uh, a cultural icon, as you said, is it, it's partly to do with the fact that life for the, like the sort of male middle class uh, was just so boring at that time like it was just going to work doing your pointless thing and coming home and going to work and like and that sort of broke through that and that's why I think so many people related to Bond not because they actually felt like they connected with him but because that's what they wanted in their life was some excitement and that they could live through well, Bond to a certain extent in that but that was like during the mining stuff like the northern mining well, I mean, like a lot of, 60, there was a 70s. lot of crap happening around that time. Yeah, that, yeah. A lot of people were like miners and stuff. <clears throat> the, the thing is also, like, you're right in that sense. And it's the same for when we, when we were teenagers. That life was so big out there. And for, you know, being a teenage kid, you can't do anything. You can yeah. just fantasize about a world. And Bond offers the ultimate male fantasy with its problems. A hell of a lot of problems yeah. in the early films. Always a bit of, you know... Uh, the, it, not Creepy. just in the early films, it's it's Is throughout. It, yeah. um, there's a whole sort of misogynistic, yeah, you know, patriarchal element to it, and there's no way you can get around that. Like you know, you just got to sort of look at it within that context. Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the fun things I, I sort of found about watching. Um, Oh, what what, the, what what was it that we watched the other day? The Man with the Golden Gun. Man yeah. with the Golden Gun, yeah, is that thinking of Bond as as a representation of like uh, essentially British colonial patriarchy. Uh, yeah. It, it's it's funny because it feels satirical. Now it probably wasn't. Like I don't I don't think that they were sitting there going, "This is really clever. Look how much of a dick Bond is being." But like. Yeah, I, I, I found quite a lot of entertainment value in it. What's <laughs> in interesting... At how awful he was, really. <laughs> What's interesting about that is, um, I think the book series by Ian Fleming started in the 50s, from what I remember. Um, and obviously England, and well, Britain as a whole, were coming off the back of two world wars. Mm -hmm. um, the empire wasn't what it was. They'd lost a lot of colonial positions within the world and given up a load of like territory. And this was almost like, oh, well, here, this is what we are still. Like, we've got secret agents that can go out and do whatever they want. And I think that, that appealed to a lot of the audience. It's a, yeah. a license to kill. It's like, oh, I could do what I want, but, like, I'm doing it for the government. And I'm, you know, being all for the empire. But I'll be a little bit rebellious and off the cuff. And, yeah, it just, I don't know, it, it goes back to that whole idea of people going to work, living their mundane lives, and then seeing this kind of thing, that, oh, imagine if I could do that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, off the back of two world wars as well, I think that just sort of tried to show to the rest of the world, oh, we're still worth something. Well, that's the thing as well. After that, like, after those two world wars, war did change to a certain extent. I mean, you know, the, 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 the sort of 19, well, basically directly after the Second World War, the Cold War came in. And, um, you know, the influence of, of the way that the Cold War was fought was entirely differently to, to any, like, other kind of wars yeah, yeah. before it. I think um, a lot of that was down to nuclear. Well, yeah, it was, but it was also down to the fact that um, these two powers were too big to face each other. If they fought each other, it would be obvious destruction, yeah. Um, and so, like, you had to, they had to do things in this more sort of subtle way of, like, proxy wars well, and stuff like that. that that's and, where and that's, Bond propagates. It exactly. Propagates from it completely. And, 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 it, and, it, and it's sort of, like, more relevant to people at the time because that's the kind of news that they're reading. Yeah. That's the kind of understanding of the world that they're but having. Again, Bond's always tried to do that with the Times. Each time it's been like, all right, what's going on in the real world? What can we make our villain associated with? To a degree, it does. Um but I think sometimes it does it whenever there's been a backlash of one of the other Bonds, which I'll touch on in a bit. Um, but yeah, most of the time they do try and fix it on certain aspects like KGB elements. I think I, I, I totaled it up. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's definitely more than six Bond films that focus on Russian 
like eccentric mm -hmm. or like Russian KGB involvement or ex-Soviet Union, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, throughout sort of the 60s right into, well, I think the most recent Russian Bond villain was The World Is Not Enough, 99. Yep. So you're talking 21 years ago. Bringing back a Russian villain now, <clears throat> don't they? Well, yeah, for the new one. Um, sorry, spoilers. <coughs> um, <laughs> if you didn't know that. <laughs> um, yeah, which is interesting, but a lot of it was like focused on you know people with their own agenda. You've got Blofeld, who was the main sort of villain. Most of iconic all. of all the villains, really. They brought him back like so many different yeah. times, and they had different actors playing him and stuff. And I know that they did that with Bond. And I suppose Bond is very Doctor Who-ish in that sense, is that whenever they change... Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is I don't think it's the Doctor Who thing. Uh, to me, it's more the, the reality. There's a don't point think, I don't think actor... Ryan was suggesting that he no, actually no, 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 regenerates. No, 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 with Doctor Who, with Doctor Who, whenever they kept, like, the... But um, they didn't do it for age reasons. For, for Bond, they had to do it for age reasons. No, they didn't. They were, they were too old. They were too old to be... Well, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, with first... Sean Connery, with Sean Connery, Sean Connery went out... Um, younger than what Roger Moore was when they brought him in. So yeah, but I mean, like, over was... time, they wanted to obviously do bigger and stronger stunts because they have to fill, they have that to modernise to so some point. Again, that goes franchise. back to my point, which I'm going to bring up later, is that whenever they needed to refresh the franchise, that's when they looked at like younger actors and stuff. Yeah. Initially, they went for like Roger Moore. Well, they, they had someone else before that. But um, they went for Roger Moore because they wanted to change Bond into like that campiness and go more cheese. Yeah. Which Roger Moore was totally for. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I like the Roger Moore ones because it's a bit tongue-in-cheek. But he's horribly misogynistic and it does my head in. But there's so much silliness. Like when we were watching The Man with the Golden Gun, they had the, the, the sheriff from... At least when I was 11 years old, favourite Bond film, Live and Let Die, the sheriff's in it. And it's such a stupid comedy cameo. There's no reason for it. It doesn't make any sense. It's just like someone watched that previous film and went, you know what, bring that sheriff back. He's hilarious. Or it was a comedian of a time who could get that sort of power to be in another Bond film. But the Roger Moore films, they always feel like they're winking at you a little bit. You know, like, this is ridiculous. And I find, I was saying it to um, Jack earlier, but Bond in itself, it had a parody real quick. After the first three or four films, there was Casino Royale, the Peter Sellers parody. And that shows just how quickly it became an iconic thing in itself. But also, how the audience knew it was getting a little bit ridiculous. So, uh, I was going to touch on this. So, the first three films, you've got, um, as we said, Doctor No from Rush of a Love and Goldfinger. Like, Goldfinger, from what I remember, isn't really that comical. There's a, a bit of a serious edge to it. And you've got, like, an iconic villain in Goldfinger. It was thereafter that it started to get a little bit more... Swing kind of, in the 60s. Well, you've know. got Thunderball, which yeah, was yeah. 1965. Um, <clears throat> and then I think it's what? Um, you Only Live Twice, 1967. Um, and then they were meant to be the last two that Sean Connery was going to do. I think they tried to get him back in for another one. Funny story, actually. So 1969, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. It was George Lesenby. Yep. And um, he lied to get the role. <laughs> so he's an Australian actor. He basically put in a fake CV or a resume, um, if you're in America, and um, lied about loads of different acting roles, and he got cast. And uh, they quite quickly then realised that uh, this was a bad choice. So they went back to Sean Connery for um, Diamonds Are Forever. See, Roger Moore just seemed like the obvious evolution of it. He was already playing the same. Yeah. He'd already recognised in the Silent audience, Templar. you know, <laughs> as some sort of suave kind of character in that respect. So it's kind of obviously going to go that way. And the 70s era of Bond just lifts really heavily from exploitation films like the black exploitation, genre picks like kung fu films, space films. It's whatever, it almost feels like whatever the American conscience is aware of, they try to cater to it. But still making it like the British are better. It's a really weird kind of thing because they're very American stories, the uh, 70s ones, you know? They're less, they're international, but they're more focused on the West's enemies in that regards. And I think, yeah, even the, um, yeah, they're all very, <laughs> the, the, the space race with uh, Moonraker, things like that, they're all American focused. And it was clear that the audience was getting bigger in America. Because obviously there'll be some immediacy, but the British were the major audience at the start. 
but over time it's become more of a big international sell. And you feel it, you feel it in the 70s films, they're very American. They, um, I think they are and they aren't. Uh, like, so Roger Moore did the um, uh, Live and Let Die, which was considered successful. Great but film. the man with the golden gun actually almost killed the franchise. Um, so after its opening weekend, it generated quite a decent like revenue, and then it just flopped. Yeah. And they had to go back and sort of kind of go, okay, how can we fix this? And it, it was, what, another three years before The Spy Who Loved Me came out? And they went back to that sort of traditional, oh, James Bond against the Russians and the KGB and stuff like that. And then they were... I wouldn't say coerced, coerced is the wrong word, but because, I suppose to touch on your point, they wanted to keep up with the trends of everything that was going on in Hollywood and cinema, they did Moonraker, because yeah, it was yeah. two years after Star Wars, which had been massive success, like these sci-fi films starting to come out, and they wanted to do, you know, a kind of a James Bond in space, which, you know, looking back... I personally think <laughs> it kind of led to him. They got more and more ridiculous. The rest of the Roger Moore films. I, I think they did. But they then... just kind of felt these are getting a bit silly now. The villains got better. Well, not not <laughs> not your uh, for your Majesty's Secret Service. That's just terrible. But View to Kill, that's an awesome villain. But that's again because of good casting. Sometimes that's one good thing that Bond always generally gets right is the perfectly cast villains. Because they get in your proper great character actors for it, you know? And Christopher Walken was awesome. Mm. As uh, Max... Oh, he's got some crazy name, but I was reading up his character yesterday and his character was uh, a, <laughs> like one of the test babies from a neo-Nazi to try and create a superhuman. That's the character he plays in <laughs> View to Kill. And it's just like, what? That's kind of mental. <laughs> Max Zorin. Max Zorin, yeah. I think that's one of my favourite things about Bond, is that sometimes you have to go, all right, Brain, you go over there and let's just take in some stuff that makes no sense and see some cool set pieces. Because a lot of it's absurd. It's but, silly as hell. It's always been like that, but it's fun. I don't think it's always been like that. No, I think but, Roger Moore was the first one that actually brought in... Because, okay, so you had Sean Connery. I think he was the pinnacle of suave. Yeah. Like, he'd walk into a room and it's almost like, oh, cool, look at that guy, like... He, he kind of had an aura around him, whereas with Roger Moore, he brought this campiness and cheese to the yeah, role. Yeah. It was very much like, I read somewhere, um, that in there was a scene, a particular scene in The Man with the Golden Gun, where in the script it said, like, oh, he's meant to grab this girl by the arm and twisted it, like, up. Yeah. And Roger Moore had actually turned around and said, oh, no, no, what he should do is just walk in and seduce her. Like... <laughs> And that, that, that just kind of tells the whole yeah, picture, yeah. really, of the Roger Moore era. Like, with the man with the golden gun, when he walks in to um, the, the bloke, the, the Asian dude who's in cahoots with Christopher Lee's character. Nick Knack. Yeah. No, no, not Nick Knack. Not the henchman. Oh, I see. You mean the other the, guy who had the sumo wrestlers for yeah. real as security guards. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whenever he kind of walks in there and there's just this naked girl in the, the pool. Yeah. And like, she just looks and was like, you want to get in? It's like, you don't know who this dude is. He just walked <laughs> on the private property. The, the 70s one plays up so much more to the more I think uh, that's, ugly fantasy types, you know? Yeah, and there's loads of stereotypes within it. Of, yeah. Of masculinity. And there's a lot there's of lots racial of stereotypes as well. It's a very... Because it, Britain's always are up, to, up front, but it's all done in a very... I don't know, very Amer American way. At that moment when he pushes that child off the boat that's trying to sell him something, yeah. it's just like, uh, you've helped me and you're done now. Out of the way, I'm British. <laughs> it's kind of funny though, when to jump into the 80s, so we, so we get towards old Timothy Dalton, yeah. Like, we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, we, we, I, I know we're getting there. <laughs> but to, uh, yeah, to jump into the 80s, yeah, like, if you think about what the new male fantasy as far as um, entertainment was, Indiana Jones. So Indi and Bond, weirdly, didn't try to, to like, comedian it. So when you think of Timothy Dalton's ones, they're a lot more adult. Or they feel a little bit more kind of scuzzy, Brian De Palma kind of, you know, that sort of, not Scarface, but those sort of gangster films that were going on around there, or crime films. They were just a little bit more sleazy and a bit more of that sexy kind of late 80s. And it's interesting, because they could have got more family orientated and tried to grab the crusade kind of crowd and they didn't it's just, well, I, 
it's a rare case of them trying to show maturity to, to the uh, franchise. And Timothy Dolan did a good job of it. The films, just nobody really watched them. They weren't as popular, were they? It was kind of like the dying point as far as box office was concerned with Bond. I don't know. Like, <clears throat> I think The Living Daylights was interesting. Like, what I find interesting about them is you have a clear distinction of the style of films that um, were coming out from the end of Roger Moore to then Timothy Dalton. Yeah. But interestingly, they were directed by the same guy. Oh, really? Um, John Glenn. So, John Glenn, I think, is the only one that... Well, he's the guy that's directed the most Bond films in yeah. six. I think the other one after that was Guy Hamilton, who has five. And the last one he did was The Man with the Golden Gun. Um, but, yeah, so, like, A View to a Kill, you can kind of see transitioning into what then would become Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton was true grit. Like, yeah. hard, bald, sort of... And maybe it was like a massive switch too soon and that's why that the films probably weren't as well, they lost the family audience especially with license to kill i think license to kill was actually like it a was higher brutal. than yeah. any other bonds being they have a and guy get eaten by a shark yeah it's, it's and they don't really hold back on the, the stuff that you see i think bond almost creates parallel universes sometimes where you go i would have been cool to see where they went with that franchise if you got like a couple more films and it might have completely changed the direction of where it went but didn't make the money so they, they stopped didn't they mm. and it's a real shame because even um, is, is it Benico Del Toro's in License to Kill he's the villain mm -hmm. I, I just remember them films being really kind of gritty he's the henchman bit. isn't he for the villain yeah yeah they just felt they didn't feel like Bond films completely and I think that's why people sort of don't like them because they're not as big and as elaborate as the schemes of Roger Moore or the suaveness of um Sean Connery. It was too soon to bring in like a more borderline reality based kind of Bond, you know? It's interesting you say that because then Pierce Brosnan got the role for GoldenEye. Yeah. And I would argue that GoldenEye is probably one of, if not, well, probably not the most, but it's probably one of the grittiest Bond films that there is. But what kind of defines it compared to the predecessors is in terms of story. So I think GoldenEye is the first Bond film that really nails the story where there's not like these plot holes. So for example, um, one of the things when we're watching The Man with Golden Gun, um, and you see it traditionally throughout Bond films, is that there's this real like upper class yeah. to how they go and kill Bond. It's like they don't just shoot him, like nitty gritty, you're done kind of thing. It's like... It, it, it they'll wasn't, capture him and put him somewhere. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll put him with a load of women who will massage him and I mean, stuff. That is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like give him a three course meal and they sit and chat for a little bit and then it's like uh, over dinner they'll be like, oh, this is how I'm going to kill you. And it's like, oh, well, thanks for telling me your secret plans. <laughs> like, And yeah, I think Goldeneye kind of goes away from that. You, there's always that impending sort of element of danger. It's not, you never see Sean Bean's character like, really sit down with Bond and have a, a, a proper full-blown conversation with him. There's the bit where he's telling him why he betrayed him and went against the double O's. But there's never that, like, oh, James, let's go out for dinner and I'll tell you why why I turned. You know what I mean? And But that gives it a sense of, I don't know, well, like I say, impending doom. You're always on the edge of your seat. And, again, with the story, the twist in that, like, I don't think there's another one, Bond film, where the... Um, you have like a double O, someone that's on his side that turns against them. and Well, this is the thing. I think that's the, the way they do that because of the closeness and having Sean Bean as a great actor. And it, it was just, it felt more emotionally connecting than most of the other Bond films tried. And like GoldenEye is sort of going, right, we're going to be over the top, but still kind of gritty and give you what is essentially like 90s at its purest. But is, it, is it over the top? Well, it still is because it goes on to the, like, the bigger spectrum internationally. Whereas the other two, they did a bit of international, but it was more... I, from what I remember, License to Kill had something to do with drug dealing. License to Kill was like the cartel. Yeah, yeah. Whereas when we went back into Goldeneye, we're back to Russia. We're back to the international. We've got the, we've got the massive, huge set piece of the tank scene, which is an amazing scene. But it's over the top as hell, you know? It's, it's, it's not ridiculous, though. And then you've got the villain who snaps people's necks with her legs and she's all sexy and stuff. She crushes them <clears> with her thighs. Yeah. You see, <laughs> we're going back into the list. I remember watching that when I was a kid and it's like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> but this is it. What's happening to my pee-pee? 
God. <laughs> that was horrible. But uh, this, <laughs> this is like, it's, it's that particular time where they're trying to go, those bits that you liked about Bond, we're bringing them back, but we're going to make sure he's a 90s grounded character to some degree. But then I always find weird, like Pierce Bronson's hair, yeah? It's the most 90s hair possible. It's shiny and it's just so 90s. And <laughs> Cat's jumped up again. <clears throat> and yeah, it, it feels really dated, all of Piers Bronson's work in the 90s, because the 90s is one of those horrible decades that gets dated real quick. Yeah, what do you mean by did it? Because, like, it, to follow up on Goldeneye, you have Tomorrow Never Dies, and it's probably not one of the greatest Bond films, but arguably, in terms of story, again, it, it was kind of ahead of itself, because it, it I mean, focuses culture, on the media. And technology. <laughs> Because <clears throat> they were like, because again, branding is one of the most important things with Bond. They have to shove as many brands in front of your face as possible. The newest car, the newest watch, the newest suit, the newest computer, whatever. And Bond was in that weird time where, did we need Bond? Like, obviously, we always need Bond. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, we'd gone into such a generation of blockbusters. Blockbusters had dominated cinema once again, and they were making them. We'd already created these new cinema icons and characters to follow and heroes. So with Bond, with it, it was. It was a weird way of how it's going to work. And that's why it worked so well with Goldeneye. Worked with um, Tomorrow uh, Never Dies. Is that the one? And then the other ones, it trailed off very quickly. Because they didn't know where to put their position. Yeah, I, I think they kind of, they lost the character, I think, of Pierce Brosnan. They, they didn't know what kind of direction to take him in. Completely. And whether or not that was just because of um, directoral changes. They changed directors quite frequently um, during Pierce Brosnan's time. But the world is not enough. I personally like it. I know you disagree, Sam. Well, but then die another day. Like The worst. I don't even know what the heck's going on in that. It has the perfect intro. Where, where they're in South Korea. Is it, yeah. uh, well, they're in North Korea, not South Korea. Yeah, he gets um, that awesome prison. Ch chase and all that. And you're like, this is really cool. It's quite great. Right, look how cool that title sequence. McDonald's song was not too bad. Great. And then it just goes, you know what? Invisible car. There's <laughs> surfing. There's a weird surfing bit. It's got there? like a... Um, a parachute and he's like gliding and the weapon explain when you explained the weapon to me again I was like that's so stupid this is dumb as the man with the long gun isn't it it's the same sort of thing <laughs> yeah like I think the man with the golden gun isn't as farce as what the um, which is saying something right yeah die another day <laughs> yeah. die another day like he gets his face completely reconfigured so he can look British and he has a British accent. It's what yeah. I, I can't remember. Yeah, he he gets his face and all done, and then he kind of infiltrates and befriends the um the government and stuff. But it, it, like again, I'm so loose on it because it was so boring and tedious to follow yeah. that you just get to a point by the end of it, and you're like, thank God that's over. Like, <laughs> um, and by this point, I think they were just trying to get names in to sort of push the brand a little bit more. You had Halle Berry in yeah. that one. Um, I think Madonna did the song, but I swear she had a cameo oh, in it. Oh, God, she did, yeah. Um, and it's just like, oh, God. Can you imagine, like, no disrespect to Adele or, like, Sam Smith or anything like that, but they had cameos in the more recent it's one. Yeah, it's almost to the same extent. It's, oh, well, put Ed Sheeran in Game of Thrones. It's like, oh, why are you shitting in my bed? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, interesting around that time, though, because they really, there's a lot of talk around that time they were going to do a spin-off on Halle Berry's character. Yeah, I because did hear that. She creates such an impact. Like, people thought, this is a great character, and Bond's dead. Bond's old, you know, oh, it's, it's done. And then, I think she did, like, Catwoman afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> and her career went yeah. right down there. And, of course, brings you to the best Bond. So, the reboot. Um, so, I'll ask you guys first. What was your initial take on Casino Royale and Daniel Craig? I really, I liked it. I th I felt like it. It just brought it back to reality in such a big way um, mm. uh, that you know. I I mean, I was I was much more used to the sort of uh, campy over the top bond with the gadgets and the sort of you know all of that kind of stuff and and they just they 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 just took all of that away basically. I don't think there's anything really that I'd describe as a gadget in that. Maybe like a tracking device or something. At one point, I can't remember, somewhere. but like. Um, yeah, there, there wasn't a, it wasn't sort of that kind of heavy on that stuff, and, and yeah, yeah. I felt like it was just a breath of fresh air for for the for the franchise really. See, for me, um, cause it came out in two thousand five, uh, six, two thousand six. Sorry, and I think I stopped watching Bond films like because I was a teenager. 
There's a four year gap between. Well, I mean, like in general. I no, no, watching... I'm just saying there was a four year gap ah, between. Okay. But yeah, I was watch. I'd be watching films when I was like, I don't know, eleven, twelve, and then after that, what I was interested in cinema completely changed. So when Casino Royale came out, I didn't watch it till like two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, because it was kind of like, wasn't that for when I was younger? Bond is it really going to entertain me now? And I was pleasantly surprised. It's a very very good film. It's very effective. Mads Mikkelsen's awesome in it. Mm, that was his first, like, uh, English film, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then Eva Green. I love Eva Green. Yeah. And, and it was just the right time in their careers. And Daniel Craig had such a bullshit fucking. People had such a problem with him. <laughs> I remember when The Sun and The Mirror and all those papers were like, oh, he's blonde. That's not our bond. He can't be blonde. And he did this whole like stunt where he was um, going over in a boat. And because he was wearing a life jacket, they were like, look at him. He's weak because he's wearing a life jacket. It's like, he's yeah. on a boat. There's always been this weird thing with uh, where, they've, they, where they've really picked out um, Daniel Craig particularly. For, yeah. like, it was only a few years ago when, when um, Piers Morgan said about uh, Daniel Craig having a baby. and oh, Do we need to see Bond with a baby? And it's like, he's not Bond. He's an actor who plays <laughs> Bond, you idiot. And that's the one thing you can really appreciate with Bond, um, with Daniel Craig. Yeah. <laughs> is that he is an actor. And, I mean, the other guys are actors, don't get me wrong, but Daniel Craig is a bloody good actor. And he's, he, he, he's managed to, to put Bond in such a bigger platform than it ever could. I remember there were talks when Casino Royale came out that he might have got an Oscar nomination, which would have been mental, right? Mm. So in my personal opinion, Casino Royale, is, um, it's my favourite. It was much needed to do a reboot. I remember being sort of 11, 12... Um, when Die Another Day came out and I really liked it at the time being younger and you don't really look at films in the same critical way as what you would now um, but as I got slightly older and then Casino Royale came out it just it just um, really kind of appealed to me it's like this real gritty edge and it's also the start of his double O tincture um, so yeah I think the opening is probably one of the only Bonds where it's not like jam-packed and action-filled. He's just sitting in a room and then the, the dude comes in and he's like, they have a little brief conversation. It's like, oh, how many kills you had? And it's intercut with a bathroom scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. And that moment is so and brutal. The whole sort of turn around shooting the gun. Um, <clears throat> he's obviously shooting at someone. And I know it's a traditional Bond, the blood and stuff comes down. But what he says to the guy is that he's had two kills. The second kill was the dude that he's talking to. Mm. So who was he shooting at? Oh. Yeah. He was just shooting. He was just having a bit of a... Hey, hey, I'm a double o -o. <laughs> But, hey. but so the, the Daniel Craig films, like... There's two particular films, I reckon, that had a major influence on it, yeah? The Bourne Ultimatum. Not the Bourne Identity, because they didn't do the same style with all of the... Run around and all that kind of stuff. I think Born Ultimatum is that oh, boom, after. Oh, Supremacy, sorry. Yeah. I always get them confused. And also, Batman Begins. Because Batman Begins was one of the big ones that worked for bringing it back to an origin story, almost. Yeah, and, and, and bringing it back to reality in that sort of like slightly gritty way. Yeah, that looks yeah, yeah. Like... I, would, I would argue that, yeah, okay, maybe, but there's only a year between the films. Mm. And I don't think that... that Batman Begins could have come out and then they completely changed their production. Not necessarily that, but it would have been a... I think it's more that they've gotten so far with like the gadgets and the farcicalness with um, Pierce Brosnan and Die Another Day that they thought, right, okay, let's do a completely like factory reset I, here. I think it was just more like it's the zeitgeist of the time, isn't it? To be like to, to be taking something that was sort of silly and over the it's top. It's to give you an understanding of how they became that icon, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's the sort of approach I mean when I think of Batman Begins. There was this way of going, all right, everyone knows everything about this person, so let's make him human again. That show you who they are and that why and, and the morality sense. I think and Bond needed that like, hugely. I think it was also because of the way that we were looking at the world at the time as well. There was like a bit of a a sort of awakening because of the Iraq War and the stuff we were finding out that was going on out there. Yeah. That like everyone started looking at things and going, "Oh, this this fantasy story that we've been telling ourselves about our, our countries and our you know institutions being like all good and brilliant is actually false and." You know, there's actually a really gritty, nasty um, thing behind it. And I think that's what, like, Casino Royale got across really well, is that 
you know this this spy uh, work isn't isn't glamorous. Well, it's, it's kind it's of carried nasty over, and, and brutal. It's interesting because I think if you take the tropes of what Bond is, like he's cocky, he's arrogant, and he's a womanizer. Um, you know, he, he's got all these different aspects to him. That every single Bond, regardless of the type of iteration that they're playing or the, the character or performance they're putting over, they always have the same tropes, just with different kind of characteristics to yeah, it. Yeah. Daniel Craig is no different, but where it is slightly different and where I think Daniel Craig stands out amongst all the other Bonds, and again, this could be down to the writing and the, the sort of... Um, yeah, so the different way that he plays it is they kind of give him more of a human aspect. Yeah. So you yeah. see with Vesper, so Eva Green's character, he's flirting with her and he's doing that cockiness and he's almost, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm flirting with you, I'm, I'm going to get you. And then as soon as he starts to unravel like sort of what she may have been through and he starts to fall for her properly and he almost dies and stuff, she gets captured, his guard drops and then you see a real human sort of character a portrayal of Bond which is slightly different and again refreshing and then when it all crumbles in on him he goes back to cold malice wall back up and I think this is where Quantum of Solace doesn't get the credit where credit's due is that that is basically a revenge film and it's also the first ever sequel to a Bond film like a direct sequel and and it, like what's so rewarding is by the end of that one he sort of gets his revenge and then goes straight back into being like right I'm back and in the Secret Service. Which there, of course, leads to Skyfall. Probably, the, the, technically, the biggest Bond film of all time, money-wise. It made so much money. Yeah. yeah. And it got loads of Oscar noms, and it was fucking great. I remember whenever Sam Mendes was announced as being the... It's exciting. You're like, wow, well, uh, the, a proper director. Did you not see all the memes at the time? It was like, um, his greatest action scene was just this bag flowing in the wind. It's like, how is he going to do a Bond film? <laughs> but the action scenes, I think in Skyfall, one of my favourite ones is the whole... Um, in the London Underground. Yeah. The train comes through and stuff. I heard loads of people criticise and say, well, how... How could he know that he was going to be captured at that exact time to set the train off to come down the, the tube at that exact time? And remember, but there's there's ways and means around it. It's not a case of that was exactly when it was going to happen. It's more that, oh, he knew it was going to happen at some point because yeah. that was his plan. He just set things in motion thereafter. Then they're running through London and stuff. And it's like, it's good to see Bond on the back foot, but like desperately on the back foot. <clears throat> see, see, for me, like my favourite thing about Skyfall is the fact that it feels like they actually put some effort into filmmaking. They got Roger Deakins, the best cinematographer in the world, to shoot it, and it is the best-looking Bond of all the Bonds. There's one scene I always remember, the fight, in an elevator sort of thing, and there's massive colours, and it's all done in silhouette. It's just beautiful. And I think what Sam Mendes... Don't get me wrong, Casino Royale started with all that, but Sam Mendes' films really went, you know what, let's make these the highest product. You know, let's make these films that people are anticipating, as opposed to going, oh, here comes another Bond. It's like... Who they're going to get to direct it? They're going to get a really great director, and Mendes has put such a high pedestal of what's expected now from a director, and um, which is kind of cool that Kerry Fugunga is doing it for um, No Time to Die because he's awesome, and it's a whole like left field choice. Was he involved in Mindhunter or something? What no, was he was True Detective. That was it. He directed the f first full season, which is you know st Did stunning. Did he not do um, the third season as well? He came back and did that. No. Was he not a writer? No. Oh, I thought he was involved. But yeah, True Detective season one's awesome. I think, for me, I think Daniel Craig is greatest Bond. I think yes. the more recent films have been brilliant and there's a, a sense of realism to them. It does start to go a little bit more far school as you get to like Skyfall and then Spectre and they kind of are reaching in terms of story. So like with Spectre, they try to link all of the other Daniel Craig films together. Yeah, yeah. This massive syndicate called Spectre. And it's like they kind of did that with Skyfall and they sort of touched on it in Quantum of Solace, but it wasn't Spectre. Um, and that, that kind of threw it for me. But after re-watching them recently, like, I found a new appreciation for it. And the scores and stuff are absolutely brilliant. I think it's Thomas Newman mm. does yes. the scores, um, especially in the last two. But, yeah, th th there's just something great about the more recent Bonds um, that just redefine it and bring this sort of sense of realism to it. And it's Daniel Craig. The thing is, they're also like this, it's just like this epic grandeur, you know? They're like proper old-school blockbusters, but done really, really well. 
mm. where everything's on. It's not just going, okay, the side characters don't have to be the greatest actors. They're getting in really good actors to be able to retell the whole Bond story. And I'd like that. Like uh, the guy who plays uh, Q, um, Ben Whitshaw. Yeah, yeah. Great actor, brilliant actor. Paddington. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the interesting thing to me about Bond is that you just couldn't make something in the same way now in, in terms yeah. of like recasting and just saying like, oh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. No one, it, there has, there doesn't have to be a rational explanation as to why James Bond's face keeps changing or, or why Q is a different person or why M is a different person. They just said, no, that all of that doesn't really matter. We're just telling a story, and yeah. we, we, you know, each Bond film on its own is a story. Like, Whereas now, like, you have to connect things up. You have to sort of say, oh, well, that's, you know, this is why that has happened. Like the amount of confusion, and I think it's partly down to the way that comic book films have changed the uh, the way that films interact with each other. You know, you don't so much have standalone films now. You have like franchises of films that connect to each other yeah. Um, and yeah Bonds you just, you, you just couldn't do it anymore I think uh, to touch on that they, they uh, again the Doctor Who sort of thing mm. like um, I remember in Doctor Who um, whenever they were pushing the whole idea of like changing the Doctor to a woman they tried it with the Master first and I think with Bond they tried to sort of do that with M so at the end of Skyfall, Judy Dench's M dies, and then Ralph Fiennes takes over as yeah, M, yeah. and then he's just referred to as M thereafter. It's kind of like, oh, okay, so M's a code name. Like they probably in future times would try that with well, 007. They, they the are, code. aren't they? No, yeah. That's a, yeah. Who's the um, the girl, the the woman in the new one? I cannot remember her name right now. So yeah, that, that, there's loads of rumours that she's going to kind of be but she the is. new... But she's the new 007. She's the new 007. Yeah, but he's but he's what I mean by it is that you yeah, know, yeah, there, was this whole, there was this whole fan theory that James Bond itself was a code name, and that's why all these different characters played it. That's what I'm saying, they could that's, use that. that. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think they are, because, because they've just done too many things to make James Bond his actual name throughout all different films. Ooh. So it would be very strange now to, yeah, he just to uses go back his code name that. while he's been retired. Tired. Yeah, and he's got his code name on his parents' graves and stuff. Like it just wouldn't make any he's sense. He's really now. selling it. Like, he's, <laughs> he's in deep. <laughs> See, the weird thing with the, the new Bond is that the new Bond, because it's been fucking ages since there was a Bond, is the last Bond of Daniel Craig. It's all going into a new direction after this, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We don't have a clue what it is, but there's been so much anticipation for the last film because it took forever to make. It's kind of curious, but it feels like new, exciting Bond because they're, they're doing different things differently because it's a new director. Yeah. yeah. We'll so, see where it goes. It's yeah. interesting. Interestingly, so it comes out in 2021 now. I think it's November, isn't it, Sam? I think... Or is it May? I think it's April. Uh, April, May. Hopefully, I need a bit of extra Bond in my life simply because in the whole near enough 60-year span of Bond, this has been the longest duration between Bond films. Did you know that? No. no Six years not. it would have been. Bond. Spectre's 2015. Mm. So, um, yeah, we need a little bit of Bond back in our lives. <laughs> so on that note, guys, um, hope you really enjoyed the podcast this week. If there's any sort of Bond films that you think are your favourite or you want to comment, um, please leave a comment. Leave a like as it helps the channel. Also, subscribe. Ring the little notification bell for everything trash arts, really. Um, we've got new content coming out. Uh, every week really and um, yeah please check out our website www.trasharts.co.uk and other than that guys thanks for listening peace out see you later bye Ta -da. Ta -da.